to Decisive Operations, Dan here, and you know what this hat means? It's time for some Napoleonics. And I gotta admit, um, I have mixed feelings about this. This is not the Napoleonics game I thought I'd be showing you guys. Uh, my first true love in Napoleonics was, and always has been, Sharp Practice. Uh, that game has a lot of personality, there's a lot of, uh, just a lot of awesome things going on with that game. But that's not what we're talking about today. What we're going to talk about today is a game uh, by Honor Publishing called Blue Shirt. Uh, this is a grand tactical scale Napoleonics game. Uh, it is a game where you're activating multiple cores. We're using the cards that are associated with this game to start the game, um, but eventually we're going to play it in six mil. Um, but the rules are scale agnostic. Uh, they use base widths, as most games do, uh, as a unit of measurement. So you can play this in 28s, you can play this in 54s if you're a crazy person like Steve Miller, um, or you can play it in 6 mil, 10 mil. Uh, what we're going to do is eventually work the 6 mil, but what we're going to show you in this video is the cards. All these cards can be bought online at the Honor website, and also Drive Through RPG uh, has a bunch of uh, fill-inable cards, uh, very nice quality poker cards that you could use. Uh, so without any further ado, we'll jump right into the video battle report and we'll start showing off uh, some Napoleonics. All right, let's talk about the Bell of the Ball of Millennium Con 22 Lucre. So Casey and I actually were looking for a 10 millimeter, 6 millimeter type Napoleonic game. And uh, before, Napole before uh, Millennium Con, uh, we bought it, I got the cards. I played a couple people in it, and um, it's a lot of fun. And right now, it just uh, it just caught fire. Uh, so right now, we're ordering all the cards. So the cool thing about this game, uh, for they call it for beginners, you can do unit cards, and you can actually buy everything for the Hundred Days campaign for Waterloo, and then you can also buy everything um, from the Honor website uh, for the Peninsula War. And then also drive through RPG has cards uh, for all the different armies. And in those blank cards, uh, it has like, this is blank. These attachments are blank for you to fill in. And even this is blank for you to fill in. So you can fill in to recreate any unit. Uh, so the first thing we'll do is just kind of point out the game and the scale. Uh, so this is a grand tactical uh, game. I guess you can call the scale. You're commanding different core. Uh, so one of the basic units that you have is a core. So right now we have two cores facing each other, one on each side. Normally you wouldn't be this small. You would have at least two cores. Otherwise the game mechanics get kind of weird. Um, but this is just us kind of showing off the rules in a very basic intro um, battle drills uh, for this game. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll just go to anatomy of a card, right? So here is a basic French infantry card. Uh, so you can see right there, it has the name, Light Infantry. Over here is what core it belongs to. So it's part of First Corps. There's its firing arcs. There's its center point. There's how much Alon it has. And Alon is awesome because these are also your wounds. So Alon and wounds, you have six. If you go down and that was one is crossed, you're routed and you're off the table. Now if you're shooting, you know how many dice you roll? you roll six. If you're in close combat, you know how many dice you roll? Right now you would roll six. And as you take more casualties, casualties the more Alon you lose and the less dice you have. Uh, this means there's attached artillery and they're gonna get plus one dice when they shoot. Uh, and this guy means that there are attached skirmishers. Uh, so in this brigade you have skirmishers, you have attached artillery, and uh, that's gonna give you different shooting bonuses and other bonuses. And you can kind of see that here in the cards. Um, another cool thing about the cards, when you have artillery, that it's a unit on its own. It's a battery on its own. Every time it fires, you can see I have some marks on here from the last time we played. Every time it fires, you're going to mark it. And then each time it fires, you lose ammo, and it's not going to be as effective as it was the first time you fired it. Uh, so that's really cool. If you ever run out of ammo, the unit is picked up and it's retired. Uh, it doesn't count as destroyed. Uh, for your total for um, total units that you were destroyed and that's usually the baseline uh, I think it's about once you have lost a third of your army your army routes so you gotta try to complete all your objectives 
without losing a third of your army, but you have opportunity to retreat units and retire them without them getting completely routed from the game. Uh, so you could save them against that total. So even though uh, third doesn't sound like it's a lot, it, it really is once you start to understand some of the strategies and the nuances of the game. Uh, one of the awesome things about Blucher is the momentum dice. So you don't know how many activations you're going to get to uh, in each turn. Uh, so each game turn is about 20 minutes in real time. Uh, and when the French player plays, it's turn one. When the British player plays or the opponent plays, it's turn two. And you go all the way to 15, or you go all the way to 30. So you effectively have in a normal game uh, 15 turns aside uh, to complete your objectives. Uh, so what happens is your opponent is going to roll momentum dice. Uh, so we're just going to show this on camera, but normally you would have a cup or something, and you roll the dice and you'd hide it, and that's the number of activations. So two, uh, this French player is extremely screwed in this scenario. So you get two activations. The opponent knows, and the French player has no idea that he only has two activations, which is awesome because while you're planning and prepping out your moves, you don't know when your turn's going to be over. Uh, so there's three ways to activate. Uh, the first way is a core activation. Um, so it has to be a part of the same core, and you have to be within one base, base width of each other. Uh, I kind of went a little bit too fast, but the base width is the primary unit of measurement. So a base width here on these cards is three inches, right? So three inches is one base width. Uh, so when you see that two and that one, kind of got ahead of myself, when you see that two and that one, um, a normal move is two, and a difficult move is one. Uh, there's no moving and shooting unless you have the little wheel symbol. So if I were to say first core with its attached artillery is going to activate, I would have to activate at least two units, and that costs two momentum. Um, so I would activate two units, and I would say these units are going to move. And in a normal move, you can do a pivot and move and face the same direction. So this guy would do a pivot, and he would move six inches and go up to here. And we'll just say this guy moves up to here. Uh, and that core activated. Uh, now that cost two momentum points. All I had was two. So after I finished moving, my opponent would tell me, you're done. Uh, one thing that's cool about this is, since I don't know, if I say I'm gonna activate this core and I'm gonna activate one, two, three, four, I would activate in one activation all four of those units. Now, even though I only rolled two and that would cost four, I'm allowed to go over. Um, so I would actually get more for than what I paid for. Uh, so that's a cool little nuance to the game. Another way you can activate is individual units. If I just wanted to activate uh, this unit over here, let's just say this artillery is off to the side. Let's make it a little bit more pretty and place the artillery on the hill because that's a fun place for artillery. Let's just say I wanted to activate one unit. I would move him as much as I want to. So I move him one base width or two base width. So I move him one base width. Now he's activated. That cost me two points. So you can see the difference if you activate from a core activation. Um, each activation is one point, but you have to do at least two. And you activate as an individual, um, it's two points for one activation. You can also choose to deploy your commander on the field and if you deploy your commander, I don't have the token for the commander, but let's just say that dice is the commander, everybody within two base with him would be able to activate, but it would end your turn. Um, and there's certain situations, we won't get it into uh, this battle drill about the CNC and how to use him, uh, but there are certain instances when you feel like if you roll three dice for your momentum, you're sitting at 12, your opponent hasn't said stop, and you have a lot of guys that activate, you know, maybe you drop your commander uh, to get more activations than you were allotted and give up your turn. Uh, one important thing to note is activations, uh, think of them as like a ladder. So if we look here on the cheat sheet, you can see right here on their cheat sheet for ways to activate core, individual units, and by command, and it ends the phase. So see that one, two, three, that's a ladder. Once you start activating units as individual units, you cannot then go and activate second core on the right side of the map that's not pictured right now, 
uh, and then come back and activate individual units. Uh, so that that's kind of stops you from just activating your full core, you know, and not thinking about how many activations you could potentially have. Let's talk about different moves. Uh, so you have your simple move. I called it a difficult move. Uh, that was incorrect. So the first number, that number two, is a simple move. And then the second number is your difficult move. So if for a simple move, let me get the focus there. A simple move, you can pivot to any direction. You can pivot to any direction, but you only can move directly forward. So he could move six inches forward that way. And you cannot uh, go through any difficult terrain when you do a simple move. And you have to end facing the direction you move. So it is possible. Let's just say these bad boys right here just took a bunch of casualties. Where's my casualty marker? Oh, they're right here. Let's just say they took a bunch of casualties, right? And they went from six alon, and now they're down to four alon. And you can use dry erase markers. You can use tokens. Eventually, I'm going to upgrade the miniatures, but as we play this game, we're just going to use the cards so you can get online uh, just to get on the table and start playing. So let's say I wanted to move him. He's done. I don't, I don't want him to get killed. I simple move him, so I turn him all the way around, have him face that direction, and then he walks back six inches. And now I have successfully done the hardest thing you can do in the military, and I've done a forward passage of line. And I was able to get them out of harm's way, and then uh, with another activation, I then can march up with these guys and continue the fight. You have your difficult move. So a difficult move is done if you're ever moving through terrain. So not hills, but if I start here, and I'm going this way and I'm continue want to go that way. If I just even touch it a little bit to go through it, it's going to be a difficult move. Or if I'm going to end facing a direction uh, that I did not start facing. So let's just say I started facing this way for some reason. I could, in a difficult move, turn, move three, and turn again, or even turn this way, or even turn this way. But the point is, I moved straight, but I'm facing right. So I'm facing a direction that I didn't move. That means a difficult move, and I can only move one base width, because that's what it says right there in the card, one base width. Uh, this one's cool here. This is a reserve move. Uh, so when you, initially, when you initially deploy your armies on the table, they're faced upside down, right? So your enemy knows there's people there, but he doesn't know essentially who that, who's there. Uh, and they won't get flipped up until they're seen. Uh, so if you have line of sight and you're within four base widths, so in this case it would be 16 inches. So the British see the two front French units, but do not see the rear units. Um, or if you move. If you ever move, then you're activated. Um, and then you flip your card over and everyone can see where you are. Um, but if your card is hidden and you're not going through difficult terrain and you're not going to go within four inches of the enemy, I'm sorry, four base widths of the enemy or visible to the enemy, you can do one reserve move and that is going to then reveal you uh, so with that reserve move i could say i'm going to activate this core right here i'm going to do a reserve move that can move up to 12 base base widths uh, so that's going to be 36 inches and you can flip directions as long as you want so this guy can completely go all the way around here and as long as he's staying out of 16 inches of the enemy and not visible right so i can't see over that crest of that hill so he can come up all the way over there so with one movement, I could have completely redeployed my forces behind my lines, around the hill, uh, to set them up for an advantage. So there is some advantage to have some of your units sit back and wait and uh, not do anything immediately. Um, and that's a reserve move. And as soon as you're done with that reserve move, uh, you're going to reveal your unit. So this would flip over, and he would be revealed. Uh, the next type of move is a charge move. Uh, so with the charge move, you can pivot up to 45 degrees. Uh, so let's just say this guy was like this. The French player is going to activate. He's going to pivot, and he moves directly forward into the greatest threat, two base widths. We're going to cheat a little bit and say he was within two base widths, regardless of terrain. Uh, so even if this would clip some trees, you could still go two base widths, make contact with the enemy, and now you're in close combat. Your unit can declare that it's going to be prepared. 
Uh, you must activate, and then instead of moving, you're going to get prepared. Um, I don't have the token handy for that, still making those. We'll put that little dice on there with a the one. Uh, so you're basically forming like a squarish type formation. Uh, so if you're a if you are infantry and cav is attacking you, uh, you would have to re-roll your successes in close combat. However, if you're prepared when cav attacks you, then the cav has to re-roll it, its successes when it attacks you. Uh, so that makes you a little bit more survivable, uh, but you're going to give the bonus to enemy artillery because you're scrunched up uh, in a tight formation to stop a cav charge. And then the final thing is retire. Uh, so if you're not within two base widths of the enemy and you can trace a straight line uh, to your enemy or to your friendly table edge uh, without passing through uh, enemy units, you can go ahead and you can retire a unit. So in this example, I had this guy, I did a simple move back there. So now that he is back, uh, the next turn I could then, if I deemed him unable to rally, or maybe he had two Alon left or one Alon left and he wasn't able to rally because you can't rally if you only have one Alon. I would then retire him from the battle. He would count as retired and he wouldn't count as destroyed. Uh, thus not giving my opponent enough victory points to win the game uh, for him. Uh, and that's all the movements. So I went in a little bit, um, a little bit more there with the movements. Uh, but there's some peculiarities with them that I want to highlight it. But at the end of the day, it's very basic, very simple. Um, and it, it just allows like a lot of cool combos and that reserve move it seems weird I know it looked weird on, on the camera it didn't really look right just trust me once you start playing this game and you get the cards that reserve move is going to make or break your game and sometimes you hang on to the reserve move too much and sometimes you use it too early and it just it's just this is a game and there's maneuver in it which is awesome most times when you're playing at like such a large scale, such a multi-core scale, I mean, even in like bolt action sometimes, depending on how big the table is, you deploy, you find the first piece of terrain and then you're not moving. This game is all about movement, which is awesome and it makes it very, uh, very enticing and very attractive uh, to me as a war gamer. Okay, shooting is very straightforward. Um, so in this scenario, we're gonna shoot. So I'm outside of one base width but within two base widths of the enemy. So I'm gonna half the amount of dice. Since my Elan is a six, we'll use this guy right here. Uh, since my Elan of this unit is a six, I'm gonna use three dice. Since I have attached artillery, I get a bonus dice. And then since I have attached skirmishers to this brigade, if I'm at long range, which is outside of one base width within two base width, I am going to hit on my first five. Normally in this game, you only do uh, damage on sixes. So I roll my dice, and my first five counts with my bonus. I have no fives, but I do have one six. Uh, so that unit right there is going to go down from seven alon to six alon. And that's how shooting works. Close combat. Let's just say we got into close combat and I then charge this unit with six Elan. We'll pretend they don't. That's guard infantry for the British. We'll just pretend that's regular infantry right there as we do this because I don't want to get too much into the bonuses. Uh, so what would happen is the French would roll six dice. One, two, three, four, five, six. And they would count all their fours. So the French rolled one, two, three, four, five. So they got a combat score of five. Now the British would roll theirs. In this scenario, they also have six. And the British got two fours up. So the score is five to two. So the defender loses by two. So what's gonna happen to the defender is he is going to, he or she is going to take as many damage as the total difference. So he'll take three damage, which will bring him down to three. And then because the French attacked, and it's very strenuous to do an attack in Napoleonic era, he's going to lose one Elan for initiating attack. No matter what, you are always going to lose at least one Elan if you're going to attack. Uh, it just takes energy to charge across the field. Uh, if this was a draw, the enemy would take one 
the attack the defender would take one damage the def the attacker or, i'm sorry the defender would take one damage the attacker would take two damage and the attacker would be forced to retreat um if the defender won the combat the attacker would take two damage and retreat all right so here we go the defender lost combat he's going to retire two base widths so that's going to be six inches in this scenario and then the french attacker can choose to pursue directly towards the enemy one base width that move cannot engage another unit so you can't just keep chain fighting nor would i recommend chain fighting because every time you do an attack you're going to lose one along you're going to get your lines non-supportive it's going to be a mess um, so that's the basics of attacks and combat uh, so we're just going to show a sample game turn uh, and just kind of show how this thing works. All out. right, it is the French the French player's turn The British player is gonna roll his momentum dice uh, So it's gonna be 2d6. We'll show it on camera even though the French player wouldn't know So it's five the French has five momentum All right, well his artillery is already in place so he's not gonna activate that he wants to keep his reserve available, so he's not going to do anything with them. Uh, so what he's gonna do is he's gonna declare he's doing a core activation, nominate these two units to do a core activation. He is then going to move them. He wants to move them two base widths and get them sucked in. He moves them two base widths. That activation is done. He looks at his opponent. The opponent says, keep going. So the French players now, he have activated a core, now he's gonna activate an individual unit. And this individual unit is gonna do a reserve move and skirt all the way around this piece of terrain and he'll flip up over there. So that is four total activations. One, two for the core move, that individual unit activated for one, two. So a total of four. His number is five, but he has nothing more to do. Uh, so he is going to say he's all done. Uh, now what happens is shooting. Now, even though you didn't activate the heavy artillery, the heavy artillery is still gonna be able to shoot in the shooting phase. So you unit is faced up and it has a target to shoot at, or it's in close combat, it's going to attack. You don't have to activate it in order to attack. So that's exciting. So the heavy artillery is gonna measure its range. He's gonna shoot this infantry over here. There are more than two base widths out. Um, and he has this little cannonball right here, which means he's heavy artillery. So he's going to get a bonus for firing. Uh, he has five dice to fire because he hasn't fired yet. And the dice says five. The marker says five there. Uh, sixes are going to inflict casualties. And the first five is also going to inflict a casualty because he has a bonus. And that's what bonuses do, right? You only have one bonus. You can have multiple things that trigger a bonus, but if you have a bonus, your first five is going to do damage. Otherwise, it's only sixes do damage. Uh, it's very streamlined and kind of easy to remember there. So he rolls his dice. He gets a hit, a hit, and a five. So that's going to count. So this British player then is going to go down uh, from six alon to three alon uh, due to all that fire. All right, the British player is now going to activate. The British player is gonna roll, or I'm sorry, the French player is gonna roll for the British player. Not show him, but he has six activations, six momentum points, uh, which is more than enough for him to do what he wants. So what the British player is gonna do, he's gonna activate his entire first core, and he's gonna do a simple move. He's gonna get sucked in right up in there And force the French into uh, to a fight and try to get sucked in before that artillery does any more damage. Uh, one thing we forgot to do is since the artillery fired, we have to mark uh, that it fired. So I would mark off that five or I put this marker on it with a four to signify that it only has uh, four more shots left before it's retired from the game. Uh, you can't move and fire because they don't have a little wheel marker on them. Uh, so normally only horse artillery and there's one uh, 95th Rifle Regiment that uh, has the ability to move and fire. Uh, so that's done, and it's back to the French player. 
So the British player, uh, this is now turn three of the game, because French player one, British player two, French player three. About an hour of ground time has happened for combat, because every turn's 20 minutes, which is something cool. So the momentum dice is five. Once again, the French player doesn't know this. Um, only the British player knows this. So what the French player is going to do is he is going to do a core activation. And with his core activation, he is going to move forward and charge with both of these guys. So he's going to activate two units. All right, and he has a total of five he can activate. So the British player tells him to keep going. He is then going to activate this unit behind to move up. He's going to activate that unit as an individual because there was no core units within um, one base width of him. So he's kind of forced to do an individual unit. So that puts him at four, but he's still good. So he's going to activate another individual unit and he's going to have them do a difficult, I'm sorry, a simple move to move them two base widths up there and six. So he's at six activations. He had five total. Now the British player tells him he's done. All right, the French player initiated combat. Uh, what he's going to do is he's going to roll six dice. One, two, three, four, five, six. He's going to count how many four-ups he has. He only got two. And now the British player is going to roll three dice. Um, but the British player also has a shield. Um, and, nope, he just has a shield. So when he's defending, the shield means... Uh, that you're steady and you get plus one in combat when you're defending. Uh, so what we're gonna do is now we're gonna roll instead of three dice, we're gonna roll four dice. So the British player also got two. The combat is a draw. So what's gonna happen is the French is gonna take one Alon damage, one casualty. I'm sorry, the French is gonna take two casualties because he was the attacker. So one for attacking one for the draw. The British is gonna take one for the draw. And the French player will go back two base widths and the British player will not be able to pursue. Now over here, we have six dice as well. For the French, the French are counting their fours up. So the French got three. And then we also have seven dice. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven dice for the British player. Uh, the British player has the shield, which is steady, so he gets a bonus dice. And he also gets... Oh, nope, that's only for attacking. So he gets a bonus dice for when he's defending, and also because they are guard infantry, they get a bonus dice if they're attacking. So either way, they're getting a bonus dice. So he's going to roll eight dice. All right, uh, this is a good example. So the British player won... Uh, one by two, right? Because three and three wipe out. However, it doesn't matter how much the defender wins by. All that matters is the defender wins. The British player will take one casualty for initiating combat, one casualty for losing, and he'll bounce back six. In, he'll bounce back two base widths. So this would take him right here. However, uh, since he is retreating from combat and he's not going to end closer to the enemy, he's going to continue going and go behind his friendly unit right there. Uh, so that's kind of a way to ensure that if your units start taking damage, uh, you get them to safety. That's why you have those supporting columns. It really uh, reinforces to do what you read in the Osprey books or what you hear about in the sharp practice novels, right? The attack column goes in and it's multiple wave after multiple wave. Uh, so stacking units like that can get you uh, that effect. Uh, so I'm gonna bump the camera and now it's turn four. This will be the last thing that we do here. So we're just gonna do a quick turn for the British player. So the British player has momentum for days. He's gonna do a core activation. This guard infantry is going to charge. These guys are the ones that had it. And this guard infantry is going to turn and move two. All 
This guard infantry is going to turn and move two base widths. And this guard infantry is going to pivot and move up to there. Uh, and that was all done with one core activation. So that's one, two, three, four. Four momentum points. British player had seven. So if he had other units, he can do another core activation, uh, individual activations, or so be it. Uh, everybody move for the British. So no attacks. I'm sorry, no shooting. So we'll go right into combat. Seven dice for the British. Uh, plus one because they have the sword, which is a shock. So they get a plus one attack dice when they're uh, initiating attack. Looking for fours, they get three successes. And the French, two, four, six. The French are looking for fours. The French got two. So what happens here is the British will take one casualty for initiating an attack. The French lose by one, so they take one casualty. And they're going to retreat two base widths, which would put them on the other end of this unit. Leapfrogging the wrong way, uh, but leapfrogging ne ne nevertheless. In this episode of Battle Drills, we went over the basics of how to play Blucher. We went over the anatomy of the card, talked about a little bit of the stats. Uh, we'll show them right here on the player play sheet. Uh, basically, it's either going to give you a plus one dice bonus in combat, um, or it's going to allow you to hit on your first five and do damage. Uh, so we talked about anatomy car, we talked about moving, all the different types of moved. Uh, we talked about charging, showed a different types of charges and how a lawn is taking off. Uh, we showed the reserve move. We showed the depletion of artillery. Um, and we didn't show in this example, um, but we demonstrated how a unit would retire from the game. Uh, so it doesn't count as destroyed and it just moves off the table and it doesn't count against your victory points. There's a lot of uh, other things we didn't cover, um, but that, that's pretty much the basics of the rules. Uh, just like the Spectre video, just like the Bolt Action video, and the Blood and Plunder, and also I just recently did a Seven Days of the River Rhine video. Uh, I'll go in more detail with more videos about the rulebook, but the first one is just to get you either push you over the edge to purchase the rule set and try it for yourself, or for something for you to watch if you've been out of the game for a little bit, um, or if you're just confused and you want to see someone else, just go over the basic mechanics. Uh, there's a lot that this offers. It offers an entire... Um, army list in the back uh, so you can either make uh, recreate historical armies or you can like make your own armies so I know we were talking you know some of us want to do Peninsula War some of us wanted to do retreat from Moscow uh, and we just kind of came to the consensus that we we're gonna treat this like bolt action a little bit uh, we're going to be semi historical with our units but maybe necessarily the units that end up facing each other wouldn't be at the same time period which is okay. I mean, that doesn't stop anyone having fun with World War II. Uh, for some reason, that, that seemed to stop us before when we tried doing 28 millimeter uh, Napoleonics. Uh, so hopefully the way this rule set's structured and the flexibility it has to build your own units as well as to do historic scenarios. And then there's, I haven't even looked at it uh, in depth, but there's an entire campaign uh, game where you have like a mini game uh, where you're maneuvering on a large map and that kind of dictates the terrain of the battle, what units arrive, and then when your reserves arrive if during the game, during the 30 turns of the game. We're all really excited for this game down in San Antonio. Um, we all bought the cards, so we're going to be playing with this game uh, like on 2D terrain and cards, um, but the intent is to eventually build up and just go all in. Just push all in and do six millimeter Napoleonics. I know it's crazy. We might seem a little bipolar. I might seem a little bipolar. How could you do 28 millimeter moderns and then the next day sit there and talk about six millimeter Napoleonics? Um, but it's a lot of fun. The maneuver that you get at that scale, the grandness of the battle, 
I mean, Sharp Practice has its own character, uh, and I love Sharp Practice. I'll continue to play Sharp Practice. I want to feature more of that game on this channel. Um, but Blucher really just... I, it, halfway through a game, you don't really see it here because it's a small example, but you know, if you see my Facebook or some of my blog posts from Millennium Con, you look at the map and you look at the battle line, and it almost looks like what you see in the Osprey books, right? Like, you can see the battle line go, and you can see the hook forming in the right flank on top of the hill. And you get rewarded when you play this game, and you use actual Napoleonic tactics as you've been reading about all this time. Uh, and for me, that that's what gets me excited uh, about this game in particular. And I just want to get excited about something Napoleonic, right? Because it's just an awesome period, and I feel like it doesn't see enough table time. There's a million games, everybody has miniatures, uh, but for the most part, good luck finding someone to have a game. Um, but this seems very newcomer friendly, uh, but there's a lot of tactical depth in this game, it seems, uh, just from the five or six times I've played it so far, and just talking to people. There's, there's a lot of nuances in the rules, uh, which don't make or break it, but allows you to level up the more you play it. And you can always appreciate that in a rule set, uh, that there's some depth while there is still simplicity. So I hope you enjoyed that um, and you tune in for future battle uh, drill episodes. Uh, we're going to go in a future episode, dive in a little bit more to some of the nuances and then maybe even highlight how to uh, do the campaign system, the mini game campaign game that you would do before a pitch battle. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed and we'll see you in the next one.